section fifteen of a far country by winston churchill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain book two chapter thirteen the good old days of the watling campaign as colonel paul varney is wont to call them are gone forever and the colonel himself who stuck to his gods has been through the burning fiery furnace of investigation and has come out unscathed and unrepentant the flames of investigation as a matter of fact passed over his head in their vain attempt to reach the man higher up whose feet they licked but him they did not devour either a veteran in retirement the colonel is living under his vine and fig tree on the lake at rossiter the vine bears catawba grapes of which he is passionately fond the fig tree the bartlett pears he gives to his friends he has saved something from the spoils of war but other veterans i could mention are not so fortunate the old warriors have retired and many are dead the good old methods are becoming obsolete we never bothered about those mischievous things called primaries our country committees our state committees chose the candidates for the conventions which turned around and chose the committees both the committees and the conventions under advice chose the candidates why pray should the people complain when they had everything done for them the benevolent parties both democratic and republican even undertook the expense of printing the ballots and generous ballots they were twenty inches long and five wide distributed before election in order that the voters might have the opportunity of studying and preparing them in order that democrats of delicate feelings might take the pains to scratch out all the democratic candidates and write in the names of the republican candidates patriotism could go no farther than this i spent the week before election in the city where i had the opportunity of observing what may be called the charitable side of politics for a whole month or more the burden of existence had been lifted from the shoulders of the homeless no church or organization looked out for these frowsy blear-eyed and ragged wanderers who had failed to find a place in the scale of efficiency for a whole month i say mr judd jason and his lieutenants made them their especial care supported them in lodging houses induced the night clerks to give them attention took the greatest pains to ensure them the birthright which as american citizens was theirs that of voting they were not only given homes for a period but they were registered and in the abundance of good feeling that reigned during this time of cheer even the foreigners were registered on election day they were driven like visiting notables in carryalls and carriages to the polls some of them as though in compensation for ills endured between elections voted not once but many times exercising judicial functions for which they should be given credit for instance they were convinced that the hon w w trulease had made a good governor and they were watling enthusiasts intent on sending men to the legislature who would vote for him for senator yet there were cases in which for the minor offices the democrat was the better man it was a memorable day in spite of mr lawler's pilot which was as a voice crying in the wilderness citizens who had wives and homes and responsibilities business men and clerks went to the voting booths and recorded their choice for trulies watling and prosperity and working men followed suit victory was in the air even the policemen wore happy smiles and in some instances the election officers themselves in absent-minded exuberance thrust bunches of ballots into the boxes in response to an insistent demand from his fellow citizens mr watling the saturday evening before had made a speech in the auditorium decked with bunting and filled with people 
for once the morning era did not exaggerate when it declared that the ovation had lasted fully ten minutes a remarkable proof it went on to say of the esteem and confidence in which our fellow-citizen is held by those who know him best his neighbours in the city where he has given so many instances of his public spirit where he has achieved such distinction in the practice of the law he holds the sound american conviction that the office should seek the man his address is printed in another column and we believe it will appeal to the intelligence and sober judgment of the state it is replete with modesty and wisdom mr watling was introduced by mr baring of the state supreme court a candidate for re-election who spoke with deliberation with owl-like impressiveness he didn't believe in judges meddling in politics but this was an unusual occasion loud applause most unusual he had come here as a man as an american to pay his tribute to another man a long-time friend whom he thought to stand somewhat aside and above mere party strife to represent values not merely political so accommodating and flexible is the human mind so practical may it become through dealing with men and affairs that in listening to judge baring i was able to ignore the little anomalies such a situation might have suggested to the theorist to the mere student of the institutions of democracy the friendly glasses of rye and water mr baring had taken in monaghan's saloon the cases he had arranged for the firm of watling founds and ripon were forgotten forgotten too when theodore watling stood up and men began to throw their hats in the air were the cavilling charges of mr lawler's pilot that far from the office seeking the man our candidate had spent over a hundred thousand dollars of his own money to say nothing of the contributions of mr scherer mr dickinson and the railroad if i had been troubled with any weak ethical doubts mr watling would have dispelled them he had red blood in his veins a creed in which he believed a rare power of expressing himself in plain everyday language that was often colloquial but never as the saying goes cheap the dinner-pail predicament was real to him he would present a policy of our opponents charmingly even persuasively and then add after a moment's pause there is only one objection to this my friends that it doesn't work it was all in the way he said it of course the audience would go wild with approval and shouts of that's right could be heard here and there then he proceeded to show why it didn't work he had the faculty of bringing his lessons home the imagination to put himself into the daily lives of those who listened to him the life of the storekeeper the clerk of the labourer and of the housewife the effect of this can scarcely be overestimated for the american hugs the delusion that there are no class distinctions even though his whole existence may be an effort to rise out of one class into another your wife he told them once needs a dress let us admit that the material for the dress is a little cheaper than it was four years ago but when she comes to look into the family stocking laughter i needn't go on if we could have things cheaper and more money to buy them with we should all be happy and the republican party could retire from business he did not once refer to the united states senatorship it was appropriate perhaps that many of us dined on the evening of election day at the boyne club there was early evidence of a republican landslide and when at ten o'clock it was announced that mr trulease was re-elected by a majority which exceeded mr grunewald's most hopeful estimate that the legislature was safe that theodore watling would be the next united states senator 
a scene of jubilation ensued within those hallowed walls which was unprecedented chairs were pushed back rugs taken up jean hollister played the piano and a virginia reel started in a burst of enthusiasm leonard dickinson ordered champagne for every member present the country was returning to its senses theodore watling had preferred on this eventful night to remain quietly at home but presently carriages were ordered and a delegation of enthusiastic friends departed to congratulate him dickinson of course grierson founds ogilvy and grunewald we found judah b talent there in spite of the fact that it was a busy night for the era and adolf scherer himself in expansive mood was filling the largest of the library chairs mr watling was the least excited of them all remarkably calm i thought for a man on the verge of realizing his life's high ambition he had some old brandy and a box of cigars he had been saving for an occasion he managed to convey to every one his appreciation of the value of their cooperation it was midnight before mr scherer arose to take his departure he seized mr watling's hand warmly in both of his own i have never he said with a relapse into the german f's i have never had a happier moment in my life my friend than when i congratulate you on your success his voice shook with emotion alas we shall not see so much of you now he'll be on guard scherer said leonard dickinson putting his arm around my chief good night senator said talent and all echoed the word which struck me as peculiarly appropriate much as i had admired mr watling before it seemed indeed as if he had undergone some subtle change in the last few hours gained in dignity and greatness by the action of the people that day when it came my turn to bid him good-night he retained my hand in his don't go yet hugh he said but you must be tired i objected this sort of thing doesn't make a man tired he laughed leading me back to the library where he began to poke the fire into a blaze sit down a while you must be tired i think you've worked hard in this campaign a good deal harder than i have i haven't said much about it but i appreciate it my boy mr watling had the gift of expressing his feelings naturally without sentimentality i would have given much for that gift oh i liked it i replied awkwardly i read a gentle amusement in his eyes and also the expression of something else difficult to define he had seated himself and was absently thrusting at the logs with the poker you've never regretted going into law he asked suddenly to my surprise why no sir i said i'm glad to hear that i feel to a considerable extent responsible for your choice of a profession my father intended me to be a lawyer i told him but it's true that you gave me my my first enthusiasm he looked up at me at the word i admired your father he seemed to me to be everything that a lawyer should be and years ago when i came to this city a raw country boy from upstate he represented and embodied for me all the fine traditions of the profession but the practice of law isn't what it was in his day hugh no i agreed that could scarcely be expected yes i believe you realize that he said i've watched you i've taken a personal pride in you and i have an idea that eventually you will succeed me here neither founds nor ribbon have the peculiar ability you have shown you and i are alike in a great many respects and i am inclined to think we are rather rare as men go we are able to keep one object vividly in view so vividly as to be able to work for it day and night i could mention dozens who had and have more natural talent for the law than i more talent for politics than i the same thing may be said about you i don't regard either of us as natural lawyers such as your father was he couldn't help being a lawyer 
here was new evidence of his perspicacity but surely i ventured you don't feel any regrets concerning your career mr watling no he said that's just the point but no two of us are made wholly alike i hadn't practised law very long before i began to realise that conditions were changing that the new forces at work in our industrial life made the older legal ideals impracticable it was a case of choosing between efficiency and inefficiency and i chose efficiency well that was my own affair but when it comes to influencing others he paused i want you to see this as i do not for the sake of justifying myself but because i honestly believe there is more to it than expediency a good deal more there's a weak way of looking at it and a strong way and if i feel sure you understand it i shall be satisfied because things are going to change in this country hugh they are changing but they are going to change more a man has got to make up his mind what he believes in and be ready to fight for it we'll have to fight for it sooner perhaps than we realize we are a nation divided against ourselves democracy jacksonian democracy at all events is a flat failure and we may as well acknowledge it we have a political system we have outgrown and which therefore we have had to nullify there are certain needs certain tendencies of development in nations as well as in individuals needs stronger than the state stronger than the law or constitution in order to make our resources effective combinations of capital are more and more necessary and no more to be denied than a chemical process given the proper ingredients can be thwarted the men who control capital must have a free hand or the structure will be destroyed this compels us to do many things which we would rather not do which we might accomplish openly and unopposed if conditions were frankly recognized and met by wise statesmanship which sought to bring about harmony by the reshaping of law and policies do you follow me yes i answered but i have never heard the situation stated so clearly do you think the day will come when statesmanship will recognize this need ah he said i am afraid not in my time at least but we shall have to develop that kind of statesman or go on the rocks public opinion in the old democratic sense is a myth it must be made by strong individuals who recognize and represent evolutionary needs otherwise it's at the mercy of demagogues who play fast and loose with the prejudice and ignorance of the mob the people don't value the vote they know nothing about the real problems so far as i can see they are as easily swayed to-day as the crowd that listened to mark antony's oration about caesar you've seen how we have to handle them in this election and in other matters it isn't a pleasant practice something we'd indulge in out of choice but the alternative is unthinkable we'd have chaos in no time we've just got to keep hold you understand we can't leave it to the irresponsible yes i said in this mood he was more impressive than i had ever known him and his confidence flattered and thrilled me in the meantime we're criminals he continued from now on we'll have to stand more and more denunciation from the visionaries the dissatisfied the troublemakers we may as well make up our minds to it but we've got something on our side worth fighting for and the man who is able to make that clear will be great but you you are going to the senate i reminded him he shook his head the time has not yet come he said confusion and misunderstanding must increase before they can diminish but i have hopes of you hugh or i shouldn't have spoken i shan't be here now of course i'll keep in touch with you i wanted to be sure that you had the right view of this thing i see it now i said i had thought of it but never never as a whole not in the large sense in which you have expressed it 
to attempt to acknowledge or deprecate the compliment he had paid me was impossible i felt that he must have read my gratitude and appreciation in my manner i mustn't keep you up until morning he glanced at the clock and went with me through the hall into the open air a meteor darted through the november night we're like that he observed staring after it a flash across the darkness and we're gone only there are many who haven't the satisfaction of a flash i was moved to reply he laughed and put his hand on my shoulder as he bade me good night hugh you ought to get married i'll have to find a nice girl for you he said with an elation not unmingled with awe i made my way homeward theodore watling had given me a creed a week or so after the election i received a letter from george hutchins asking me to come to elkington i shall not enter into the details of the legal matter involved many times that winter i was a guest at the yellow brick house and i have to confess as spring came on that i made several trips to elkington which business necessity did not absolutely demand i considered maud hutchins and found the consideration rather a delightful process as became an eligible and successful young man i was careful not to betray too much interest and i occupied myself at first with a review of what i deemed her shortcomings not that i was thinking of marriage but i had imagined the future mrs parrot as tall maud was up to my chin again the hair of the fortunate lady was to be dark and maud's was golden red my ideal had a spree lightness of touch the faculty of seizing just the aspect of a subject that delighted me and a knowledge of the world maud was simple direct and in a word provincial her provinciality however was negative rather than positive she had no disagreeable mannerisms her voice was not nasal her plasticity appealed to me i suppose i was lost without knowing it when i began to think of moulding her all of this went on at frequent intervals during the winter and while i was organizing the elkington power and traction company for george i found time to dine and sup at maud's house and to take walks with her i thought i detected an incense deliciously sweet by no means overpowering like the lilies but more like the shy fragrance of the wood flower i recall her kind welcomes the faint deepening of colour in her cheeks when she greeted me and while i suspected that she looked up to me she had a surprising and tantalising self-command there came moments when i grew slightly alarmed as for instance one sunday in the early spring when i was dining at the ezra hutchins's house and surprised mrs hutchins's glance on me suspecting her of seeking to divine what manner of man i was i became self-conscious i dared not look at maud who sat across the table thereafter i began to feel that the hutchins connection regarded me as a suitor i had grown intimate with george and his wife who did not refrain from sly allusions and george himself once remarked with characteristic tact that i was most conscientious in my attention to the traction affair i have reason to believe they were even less delicate with maud this was the logical time to withdraw but i dallied the experience was becoming more engrossing if i may so describe it and spring was approaching the stars and their courses were conspiring i was by no means as yet a self-acknowledged wooer and we discussed love in its lighter phases through the medium of literature heaven forgive me for calling it so about that period it will be remembered a mushroom growth of volumes of a certain kind sprang into existence little books with artistic bindings and wide margins sweetened essays some of them written in beautiful english by dilettante authors for drawing-room consumption and collections of short stories no doubt chiefly bought by philanderers like myself who were thus enabled to skate on thin ice over deep water it was a most delightful relationship that these helped to support 
and i fondly believed i could reach shore again whenever i chose there came a sunday in early may one of those days when the feminine assumes a large importance i had been to the hutchinses church and maude as she sat and prayed decorously in the pew beside me suddenly increased in attractiveness and desirability her voice was very sweet and i felt a delicious and languorous thrill which i identified not only with love but also with a reviving spirituality how often the two seemed to go hand in hand she wore a dress of a filmy material mauve with a design in gold thread running through it of late it seemed she had had more new dresses and their modes seemed more cosmopolitan at least to the masculine eye how delicately her hair grew in little shining wisps around her white neck i could have reached out my hand and touched her and it was this desire although by no means overwhelming that startled me did i really want her the consideration of this vital question occupied the whole time of the sermon made me distrait at dinner a large family gathering later i found myself alone with her on a bench in the hutchinses garden where we had walked the day of my arrival during the campaign the gardens were very different now the trees had burst forth again into leaf the spiria bushes seemed weighted down with snow and with a note like that of the quivering bass string of a cello the bees hummed among the fruit blossoms and there beside me in her filmy dress was maud a part of it all the meaning of all that set my being clamouring she was like some ripened delicious flower ready to be picked one of those pernicious make-believe volumes had fallen on the bench between us for i could not read any more i could not think i touched her hand and when she drew it gently away i glanced at her reason made a valiant but hopeless effort to assert itself was i sure that i wanted her for life no use i wanted her now no matter what price that future might demand an awkward silence fell between us awkward to me at least and i her guide and mentor became banal apologetic confused i made some idiotic remark about being together in the garden of eden i remember mr doddridge saying in bible class that it was supposed to be on the euphrates she replied but it's been destroyed by the flood let's make another one of our own i suggested why how silly you are this afternoon what's to prevent us maud i demanded with a dry throat nonsense she laughed in proportion as i lost poise she seemed to gain it it's not nonsense i faltered if we were married at last the fateful words were pronounced irrevocably and instead of qualms i felt nothing but relief joy that i had been swept along by the flood of feeling she did not look at me but gazed straight ahead of her if i love you maud i stammered after a moment but i don't love you she replied steadily never in my life had i been so utterly taken aback do you mean i managed to say that after all these months you don't like me a little liking isn't loving she looked me full in the face i like you very much but there i stopped paralyzed by what appeared to me the quintessence of feminine inconsistency and caprice yet as i stared at her she certainly did not appear capricious it is not too much to say that i was fairly astounded at this evidence of self-command and decision of the strength of mind to refuse me was it possible that she had felt nothing and i all i got to my feet i hate to hurt your feelings i heard her say i'm very sorry she looked up at me afterwards when reflecting on the scene i seemed to remember that there were tears in her eyes i was not in a condition to appreciate her splendid sincerity 
i was overwhelmed and inarticulate i left her there on the bench and went back to george's announcing my intention of taking the five o'clock train maude hutchins had become at a stroke the most desirable of women i have often wondered how i should have felt on that five-hour journey back to the city if she had fallen into my arms i should have persuaded myself no doubt that i had not done a foolish thing in yielding to an impulse and proposing to an inexperienced and provincial young woman yet there would have been regrets in the background too deeply chagrined to see any humour in the situation i settled down in a pullman seat and went over and over again the event of that afternoon until the train reached the city as the days wore on and i attended to my cases i thought of maud a great deal and in those moments when the pressure of business was relaxed she obsessed me she must love me only she did not realize it that was the secret her value had risen amazingly become supreme the very act of refusing me had emphasized her qualifications as a wife and i now desired her with all the intensity of a nature which had been permitted always to achieve its objects the inevitable process of idealization began in dusty offices i recalled her freshness as she had sat beside me in the garden the freshness of a flower with berkeleyan subjectivism i clothed the flower with colour bestowed it with fragrance i conferred on maud all the gifts and graces that woman had possessed since the creation and i recalled with mingled bitterness and tenderness the turn of her head the down on her neck the half-revealed curve of her arm in spite of the growing sordidness of lime street my mother and i still lived in the old house for which she very naturally had a sentiment in vain i had urged her from time to time to move out into a brighter and fresher neighbourhood it would be time enough she said when i was married if you wait for that mother i answered we shall spend the rest of our lives here i shall spend the rest of my life here she would declare but you you have your life before you my dear you would be so much more contented if if you could find some nice girl i think you live too feverishly i do not know whether or not she suspected me of being in love nor indeed how much she read of me in other ways i did not confide in her nor did it strike me that she might have yearned for confidences though sometimes when i dined at home i surprised her gentle face framed now with white hair lifted wistfully toward me across the table our relationship indeed was a pathetic projection of that which had existed in my childhood we had never been confident then the world in which i lived and fought of great transactions and merciless consequences frightened her her own world was more limited than ever she heard disquieting things i am sure from cousin robert breck who had become more and more querulous since the time-honoured firm of breck and company had been forced to close its doors and the home at claremore had been sold my mother often spent the day in the scrolled suburban cottage with the coloured glass front door where he lived with the kinleys and helen if my mother suspected that i was anticipating marriage and said nothing nancy durrett suspected and spoke out life is such a curious succession of contradictions and surprises that i record here without comment the fact that i was seeing much more of nancy since her marriage than i had in the years preceding it a comradeship existed between us i often dined at her house and had fallen into the habit of stopping there frequently on my way home in the evening ham did not seem to mind what was clear at any rate was that nancy before marriage had exacted some sort of an understanding by which her freedom was not to be interfered with she was the first among us of the modern wives ham whose heart-strings and purse-strings were oddly intertwined had stipulated that they were to occupy the old durrett mansion 
but when nancy had made it livable as she expressed it he is said to have remarked that he might as well have built a new house and been done with it not even old nathaniel himself would have recognized his home when nancy finished what she termed furnishing out went the horsehair the hideous chandeliers the stuffy books the recamer statuary and an army of upholsterers woodworkers etc from boston and new york invaded the place the old mahogany doors were spared but matched now by chippendale and sheraton the new polished floors were covered with oriental rugs the dreary durrett pictures replaced by good canvases and tapestries nancy had what amounted to a genius for interior effects and she was the first to introduce among us the luxury that was to grow more and more prevalent as our wealth increased by leaps and bounds only nancy's luxury though lavish was never vulgar and her house when completed had rather marvellously the fine distinction of some old london mansion filled with the best that generations could contribute it left mrs frederick grierson whose residence on the heights had hitherto been our grandest breathless with despair with characteristic audacity nancy had chosen old nathaniel's sanctum for her particular salon into which ham himself did not dare to venture without invitation it was hung in pompeian red and had a little wrought iron balcony projecting over the yard now transformed by an expert into a garden when i had first entered this room after the metamorphosis had taken place i inquired after the tombstone mantel oh i've pulled it up by its roots she said aren't you afraid of ghosts i inquired do i look it she asked and i confessed that she didn't indeed all ghosts were laid nor was there about her the slightest evidence of mourning or regret one was forced to acknowledge her perfection in the part she had chosen as the arbitress of social honours the candidates were rapidly increasing almost every month it seemed some one turned up with a fortune and the aspirations that go with it and it was mrs durrett who decided the delicate question of fitness with these and with the world at large her manner might best be described as difficult and i was often amused at the way in which she contrived to keep them at arm's length and make them uncomfortable with her intimates of whom there were few she was frank i suppose you enjoy it i said to her once of course i enjoy it or i shouldn't do it she retorted it isn't the real thing as i told you once but none of us gets the real thing it's power just as you enjoy what you're doing sorting out the unfit it's a game it keeps us from brooding over things we can't help and after all when we have good appetites and are fairly happy why should we complain i'm not complaining i said taking up a cigarette since i still enjoy your favour she regarded me curiously and when you get married hugh sufficient unto the day i replied how shall i get along i wonder with that simple and unsophisticated lady when she appears well i said you wouldn't marry me she shook her head at me and smiled no she corrected me you like me better as ham's wife than you would have as your own i merely laughed at this remark it would indeed have been difficult to analyse the new relationship that had sprung up between us to say what elements composed it the roots of it went back to the beginning of our lives and there was much of sentiment in it no doubt she understood me as no one else in the world understood me and she was fond of me in spite of it hence when i became infatuated with maud hutchins after that sunday when she so unexpectedly had refused me i might have known that nancy's suspicions would be aroused she startled me by accusing me out of a clear sky of being in love i denied it a little too emphatically why shouldn't you tell me hugh if it's so she asked i didn't hesitate to tell you it was just before her departure for the east to spend the summer we were on the balcony shaded by the big maple that grew at the end of the garden but there's nothing to tell i insisted 
she lay back in her chair regarding me did you think that i'd be jealous there's nothing to be jealous about i've always expected you to get married hugh i've even predicted the type she had in truth with an accuracy almost uncanny the only thing i'm afraid of is that she won't like me she lives in that place you've been going to so much lately doesn't she of course she had put two and two together my visits to elkington and my manner which i had flattered myself had not been distrait on the chance that she knew more from some source i changed my tactics i suppose you mean maud hutchins i said nancy laughed so that's her name it's the name of a girl in elkington i've been doing legal work for the hutchinses and i imagine some idiot has been gossiping she's just a young girl much too young for me men are queer creatures she declared did you think i should be jealous it was exactly what i had thought but i denied it why should you be even if there were anything to be jealous about you didn't consult me when you got married you merely announced an irrevocable decision nancy leaned forward and laid her hand on my arm my dear she said strange as it may seem i want you to be happy i don't want you to make a mistake hugh too great a mistake i was surprised and moved once more i had a momentary glimpse of the real nancy our conversation was interrupted by the arrival of ralph hambleton End of section 15section 16 of a far country by winston churchill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain book two chapter fourteen however thoughts of maud continued to possess me she still appeared the most desirable of beings and a fortnight after my repulse without any excuse at all i telegraphed the george hutchinses that i was coming to pay them a visit mrs george wearing a knowing smile met me at the station in a light buckboard i've asked maud to dinner she said thus with masculine directness i returned to the charge and maud's continued resistance but increased my ardour could not see why she continued to resist me because i don't love you she said this was incredible i suggested that she didn't know what love was and she admitted it was possible she liked me very very much i told her sagely that this was the best foundation for matrimony that might be but she had had other ideas for one thing she felt that she did not know me in short she was charming and maddening in her defensive ruses in her advances and retreats for i pressed her hard during the four weeks which followed and in them made four visits flinging caution to the winds i did not even pretend to george that i was coming to see him on business i had the hutchins family on my side for they had the sense to see that the match would be an advantageous one i even summoned up enough courage to talk to ezra hutchins on the subject i'll not attempt to influence maud mr parrot i've always said i wouldn't interfere with her choice but as you are a young man of sound habits sir successful in your profession i should raise no objection i suppose we can't keep her always to conceal his emotion he pulled out the watch he lived by why it's church time he said i attended church regularly at elkington on a sunday night in june following a day during which victory seemed more distant than ever with startling unexpectedness maud capitulated she sat beside me on the bench obscured yet the warm night quivering with her presence i felt her tremble i remember the first exquisite touch of her soft cheek how strange it was that in conquest the tumult of my being should be stilled 
that my passion should be transmuted into awe that thrilled yet disquieted what had i done it was as though i had suddenly entered an unimagined sanctuary filled with holy flame presently when we began to talk i found myself seeking more familiar levels i asked her why she had so long resisted me accusing her of having loved me all the time yes i think i did hugh only i didn't know it you must have felt something that afternoon when i first proposed to you you didn't really want me hugh not then surprised and a little uncomfortable at this evidence of intuition i started to protest it seemed to me then as though i had always wanted her no no she exclaimed you didn't you were carried away by your feelings you hadn't made up your mind indeed i can't see why you want me now you believe i do i said and drew her toward me yes i i believe it now but i can't see why there must be so many attractive girls in the city who know so much more than i do i sought fervidly to reassure her on this point at length when we went into the house she drew away from me at arm's length and gave me one long searching look as though seeking to read my soul hugh you will always love me to the very end won't you yes i whispered always in the library one on each side of the table under the lamp ezra hutchins and his wife sat reading mrs hutchins looked up and i saw that she had divined mother i am engaged to hugh maud said and bent over and kissed her ezra and i stood gazing at them then he turned to me and pressed my hand well i never saw the man who was good enough for her hugh but god bless you my son i hope you will prize her as we prize her mrs hutchins embraced me and through her tears she too looked long into my face when she had released me ezra had his watch in his hand if you're going on the ten o'clock train hugh father maude protested laughing i must say i don't call that very polite in the train i slept but fitfully awakening again and again to recall the extraordinary fact that i was now engaged to be married to go over the incidents of the evening indifferent to the backings and the bumpings of the car the voices in the stations the clanging of locomotive bells and all the incomprehensible startings and stoppings exalted yet troubled i beheld maude luminous with the love i had amazingly awakened a love somewhere beyond my comprehension for her indeed marriage was made in heaven but for me could i rise now to the ideal that had once been mine thrust henceforth evil out of my life love forever live always in this sanctuary she had made for me would the time come when i should feel a sense of bondage the wedding was set for the end of september i continued to go every week to elkington and in august maude and i spent a fortnight at the sea there could be no doubt as to my mother's happiness as to her approval of maude they loved each other from the beginning i can picture them now sitting together with their sewing on the porch of the cottage at Mattapoisett, Out of the bay, little white caps danced in the sunlight, sailboats tacked hither and thither, the strong cape breeze, laden with invigorating salt, stirred Maud's hair, and occasionally played havoc with my papers. "'She is just the wife for you, Hugh,' my mother confided to me. "'If I had chosen her myself, I could not have done better.' she added with a smile i was inclined to believe it but maude would have none of this illusion he just stumbled across me she insisted we went on long sails together towards wood's hole and the open sea the sprays washing over us her cheeks grew tanned 
sometimes when i praised her and spoke confidently of our future she wore a troubled expression what are you thinking about i asked her once you mustn't put me on a pedestal she said gently i want you to see me as i am i don't want you to wake up some day and be disappointed i'll have to learn a lot of things and you'll have to teach me i can't get used to the fact that you who are so practical and successful in business should be such a dreamer where i am concerned i laughed and told her comfortably that she was talking nonsense what did you think of me when you first knew me i inquired well she answered with the courage that characterized her i thought you were rather calculating and that you put too high a price on success of course you attracted me i own it you hid your opinions rather well i retorted somewhat discomfited she flushed have you changed them i demanded i think you have that side and i think it is a weak side hugh it's hard to tell you this but it's better to say so now since you ask me i do think you set too high a value on success well now that i know what success really is perhaps i shall reform i told her i don't like to think that you fool yourself she replied with a perspicacity i should have found extraordinary throughout my life there have been days and incidents some trivial some important that linger in my memory because they are saturated with atmosphere i recall for instance a gala occasion in youth when my mother gave one of her luncheon parties on my return from school the house and its surroundings wore a mysterious exciting and unfamiliar look somehow changed by the simple fact that guests sat decorously chatting in a dining-room shining with my mother's best linen and treasured family silver and china the atmosphere of my wedding day is no less vivid the house of ezra hutchins was scarcely recognizable its doors and windows were opened wide and all the morning people were being escorted upstairs to an all-significant room that contained a collection like a jeweller's exhibit a bewildering display there was a massive punch-bowl from which dangled the card of mr and mrs adolf scherer a really wonderful tea-set of old english silver given by senator and mrs watling and nancy willett with her certainty of good taste had sent an old english tankard of the time of the second charles the secret was in that room and it magically transformed for me as i stood momentarily alone in the doorway where i had first beheld maude the accustomed scene and charged with undivined significance the blue shadows under the heavy foliage of the maples the september sunlight was heavy tinged with gold so fragmentary and confused are the events of that day that a cubist literature were necessary to convey the impressions left upon me i had something of the feeling of a recruit who for the first time is taking part in a brilliant and complicated manoeuvre tom and susan peters flit across the view and jean hollister and perry blackwood and the ewanses all of whom had come up in a special car ralph hambleton was best man looking preternaturally tall in his frock coat and his manner throughout the whole proceeding was one of good-natured tolerance toward a folly none but he might escape if you must do it hughie i suppose you must he had said to me i'll see you through of course but don't blame me afterwards maude was a little afraid of him i dressed at george's then like one of those bewildering shifts of a cinematograph comes the scene in church the glimpse of my mother's wistful face in the front pew and i found myself in front of the austere mr doddridge standing beside maude or rather beside a woman i tried hard to believe was maude so veiled and generally encased was she i was thinking of this 
all the time i was mechanically answering mr doddridge and even when the wedding march burst forth and i led her out of the church it was as though they had done their best to disguise her to put our union on the otherworldly plane that was deemed to be its only justification to neutralize her sex at the very moment it should have been most enhanced well they succeeded if i had not been as conventional as the rest i should have preferred to have run away with her in the lavender dress she wore when i first proposed to her it was only when we had got into the carriage and started for the house and she turned to me her face from which the veil had been thrown back that i realized what a sublime meaning it all had for her her eyes were wet once more i was acutely conscious of my inability to feel deeply at supreme moments for months i had looked forward with anticipation and impatience to my wedding day i kissed her gently but i felt as though she had gone to heaven and that the face i beheld enshrouded were merely her effigy commonplace words were inappropriate yet it was to these i resorted well it wasn't so bad after all was it she smiled at me you don't want to take it back she shook her head i think it was a beautiful wedding hugh i'm so glad we had a good day she seemed shy at once very near and very remote i held her hand awkwardly until the carriage stopped a little later we were standing in a corner of the parlour the atmosphere of which was heavy with the scent of flowers submitting to the onslaught of relatives then came the wedding breakfast croquettes champagne chicken salad ice cream the wedding cake speeches and more kisses i remember tom peters holding on to both my hands good-bye and god bless you old boy he was saying susan in view of the occasion had allowed him a little more champagne than usual enough to betray his feelings and i knew that these had not changed since our college days i resolved to see more of him i had neglected him and undervalued his loyalty he had followed me to my room in george's house where i was dressing for the journey and he gave it as his deliberate judgment that in maud i had struck gold she's just the girl for you hughie he declared susan thinks so too later in the afternoon as we sat in the stateroom of the car that was bearing us eastward maud began to cry i sat looking at her helplessly unable to enter into her emotion resenting it a little yet i tried awkwardly to comfort her i can't bear to leave them she said but you will see them often when we come back i reassured her it was scarcely the moment for reminding her of what she was getting in return this peculiar family affection she evinced was beyond me i had never experienced it in any poignant degree since i had gone as a freshman to harvard and yet i was struck by the fact that her emotions were so rightly placed it was natural to love one's family i began to feel vaguely as i watched her that the new relationship into which i had entered was to be much more complicated than i had imagined twilight was coming on the train was winding through the mountain passes crossing and recrossing a swift little stream whose banks were massed with alder here and there on the steep hillsides blazed the goldenrod presently i turned to surprise in her eyes a wide questioning look the look of a child even in this irrevocable hour she sought to grasp what manner of being was this to whom she had confided her life and with whom she was faring forth into the unknown the experience was utterly unlike my anticipation yet i responded the kiss i gave her had no passion in it i'll take good care of you maud i said suddenly in the fading light she flung her arms around me pressing me tightly desperately oh i know you will hugh dear and you'll forgive me won't you for being so horrid to-day of all days i do love you 
neither of us had ever been abroad and although it was before the days of swimming pools and gymnasiums and a la carte cafes on ocean liners the atlantic was imposing enough maude had a more lasting capacity for pleasure than i a keener enjoyment of new experiences and as she lay beside me in the steamer chair where i had carefully tucked her she would exclaim i simply can't believe it hugh it seems so unreal i'm sure i shall wake up and find myself back in elkington don't speak so loud my dear i cautioned her there were some very formal-looking new yorkers next us no i won't she whispered but i'm so happy i feel as though i should like to tell everyone there's no need i answered smiling oh hugh i don't want to disgrace you she exclaimed in real alarm otherwise so far as i am concerned i shouldn't care who knew people smiled at her women came up and took her hands and on the fourth day the formidable new yorkers unexpectedly thawed i had once thought of maude as plastic then i had discovered she had a mind and will of her own once more she seemed plastic her love had made her so was it not what i had desired i had only to express a wish and it became her law nay she appealed to me many times a day to know whether she had made any mistakes and i began to drill her in my silly traditions gently very gently well i shouldn't be quite so familiar with people quite so ready to make acquaintances maud you have no idea who they may be some of them of course like the sardells i know by reputation the sardells were the new yorkers who sat next us i'll try hugh to be more reserved more like the wife of an important man she smiled it isn't that you're not reserved i replied ignoring the latter half of her remark nor that i want you to change i said i only want to teach you what little of the world i know myself and i want to learn hugh you don't know how i want to learn the sight of mist-ridden liverpool is not a cheering one for the american who first puts foot on the mother country soil a liverpool of yellow browns and dingy blacks of tilted funnels pouring out smoke into an atmosphere already charged with it the long wharves and shed roofs glistened with moisture just think hugh it's actually england she cried as we stood on the wet deck but i felt as though i'd been there before no wonder they're addicted to cold baths i replied they must feel perfectly at home in them especially if they put a little lamp black in the water maude laughed you grumpy old thing she exclaimed nothing could dampen her ardour not the sight of the rain-soaked stone houses when we got ashore nor even the frigid luncheon we ate in the lugubrious hotel for her it was all quaint and new finally we found ourselves established in a compartment upholstered in light grey with tassels and arm supporters on the window of which was pasted a poster with the word reserved in large red letters the guard inquired respectfully as the porter put our luggage in the racks whether we had everything we wanted the toy locomotive blew its toy whistle and we were off for the north past dingy yellow tenements of the smoking factory towns and stretches of orderly hedge-spaced rain-swept country the quaint cottages we glimpsed the sight of distant stately mansions on green slopes caused maude to cry out with rapture oh hugh there's a manor house more vivid than were the experiences themselves of that journey are the memories of them we went to wind-swept sabbath-keeping edinburgh to high stirling and dark holyrood and to abbotsford it was through sir walter's eyes we beheld melrose bathed in autumn light by his aid repeopled it with forgotten monks eating their fast-day kale and as we sat reading and dreaming in the still sunny corners i forgot that struggle for power in which i had been so furiously engaged since leaving cambridge 
legislatures politicians and capitalists receded into a dim background and the gift i had possessed in youth of living in a realm of fancy showed astonishing signs of revival why hugh maude exclaimed you ought to have been a writer you've only just begun to fathom my talents i replied laughingly did you think you'd marry just a dry old lawyer i believe you capable of anything she said i grew more and more to depend on her for little things she was a born housewife it was pleasant to have her do all the packing while i read or sauntered in the queer streets about the inns and she took complete charge of my wardrobe she had a talent for drawing and as we went southward through england she made sketches of the various houses that took our fancy suggestions for future home building we spent hours in the evenings in the inn sitting-rooms incorporating new features into our residence continually modifying our plans now it was a tudor house that carried us away now a jacobian and again an early georgian with enfolding wings and wrought iron grill a stage of bewilderment succeeded maud i knew loved the cottages best she said they were more homelike but she yielded to my liking for grandeur my i should feel lost in a palace like that she cried as we gazed at the marquee of so-and-so's country seat well of course we should have to modify it i admitted perhaps perhaps our family will be larger she put her hand on my lips and blushed a fiery red we examined with other tourists at a shilling apiece historic mansions with endless drawing-rooms halls libraries galleries filled with family portraits elaborate formal bedrooms where famous sovereigns had slept all roped off and carpeted with canvas strips to protect the floors through mullioned windows we caught glimpses of gardens and geometrical parterres lakes fountains statuary fantastic topiary and distant stretches of park maud sighed with admiration but did not covet she had me but i was often uncomfortable resenting the vulgar gaping tourists with whom we were herded and the easy familiarity of the guides these did not trouble maud who often annoyed me by asking naive questions herself i would nudge her one afternoon when with other compatriots we were being hurried through a famous castle the guide unwittingly ushered us into a drawing-room where the owner and several guests were seated about a tea-table i shall never forget the stares they gave us before we had time precipitately to retreat nor the feeling of disgust and rebellion that came over me this was heightened by the remark of a heavy six-foot ohioan with an infantile face and a genial manner i notice that they didn't invite us to sit down and have a bite he said i call that kind of inhospitable it was his lordship himself exclaimed the guide scandalized you don't say drawled our fellow-countryman i guess i owe you another shilling my friend the guide utterly bewildered accepted it the transatlantic point of view towards the nobility was beyond him his lordship could make a nice little income if he set up as a side show added the ohioan maud giggled but i was furious and no sooner were we outside the gates that i declared i should never again enter a private residence by the back door why hugh how queer you are sometimes she said i may be queer but i have a sense of fitness i retorted she asserted herself i can't see what difference it makes they didn't know us and if they admit people for money i can't help it and as for the man from ohio but he was so funny she interrupted and he was really very nice i was silent her point of view eminently sensible as it was exasperated me we were leaning over the parapet of a little stone bridge her face was turned away from me but presently i realized that she was crying 
men and women villagers passing across the bridge looked at us curiously i was miserable and somewhat appalled resentful yet striving to be gentle and conciliatory i assured her that she was talking nonsense that i loved her but i did not really love her at that moment nor did she relent as easily as usual it was not until we were together in our sitting-room a few hours later that she gave in i felt a tremendous sense of relief you i'll try to be what you want you know i am trying but don't kill what is natural in me i was touched by the appeal and repentant it is impossible to say when the little worries annoyances and disagreements began when i first felt a restlessness creeping over me i tried to hide these moods from her but always she divined them and yet i was sure that i loved maude in a surprisingly short period i had become accustomed to her dependent on her ministrations and the normal cosy intimacy of our companionship i did not like to think that the keen edge of the enjoyment of possession was wearing a little while at the same time i philosophized that the divine fire when legalized settles down to a comfortable glow the desire to go home that grew upon me i attributed to the irritation aroused by the spectacle of a fixed social order commanding such unquestioned deference from the many who were content to remain resignedly outside of it before the setting in of the liberal movement and the american invasion england was a country in which from my point of view one must be somebody in order to be happy i was somebody at home or at least rapidly becoming so london was shrouded parliament had risen and the great houses were closed day after day we issued forth from a musty and highly respectable hotel near piccadilly to a gloomy tower a soggy hampton court or a mournful british museum our native longing for luxury or rather my native longing impelled me to abandon smith's hotel for a huge hostelry where our suite overlooked the thames where we ran across a man i had known slightly at harvard and other americans with whom we made excursions and dined and went to the theatre maude liked these persons i did not find them especially congenial my lifelong habit of unwillingness to accept what life sent in its ordinary course was asserting itself but maud took her friends as she found them and i was secretly annoyed by her lack of discrimination in addition to this the sense of having been pulled up by the roots grew on me suppose maud surprised me by suggesting one morning as we sat at breakfast watching the river craft flit like phantoms through the yellow-green fog suppose we don't go to france after all hugh not go to france i exclaimed are you tired of the trip oh hugh her voice caught i could go on always if you were content and what makes you think i'm not content her smile had in it just a touch of wistfulness i understand you hugh better than you think you want to get back to your work and and i should be happier i'm not so silly and so ignorant as to think that i can satisfy you always and i'd like to get settled at home i really should there surged up within me a feeling of relief i seized her hand as it lay on the table we'll come abroad another time and go to france i said maud you're splendid she shook her head oh no i'm not you do satisfy me i insisted it isn't that at all but i think perhaps it would be wiser to go back it's rather a crucial time with me now that mr watling's in washington i've just arrived at a position where i shall be able to make a good deal of money and later on it isn't the money hugh she cried with a vehemence which struck me as a little odd i sometimes think we'd be a great deal happier without 
without all you are going to make i laughed well i haven't made it yet she possessed the frugality of the hutchinses and sometimes my lavishness had frightened her as when we had taken the suite of rooms we now occupied are you sure you can afford them hugh she had asked when we first surveyed them i began married life and carried it on without giving her any conception of the state of my finances she had an allowance from the first as the steamer slipped westward my spirits rose to reach a climax of exhilaration when i saw the towers of new york rise gleaming like huge stalagmites in the early winter sun maud likened them more happily to gigantic ivory chessmen well new york was america's chessboard and the great players had already begun to make moves that astonished the world as we sat at breakfast in a fifth avenue hotel i ran my eye eagerly over the stock market reports and the financial news and rallied maud for a lack of spirits aren't you glad to be home i asked her as we sat in a hansom of course i am hugh she protested but i can't look upon new york as home somehow it frightens me i laughed indulgently you'll get used to it i said we'll be coming here a great deal off and on she was silent but later when we took a hansom and entered the streams of traffic she responded to the stimulus of the place the movement the colour the sight of the well-appointed carriages of the well-fed well-groomed people who sat in them the enticement of the shops in which we made our purchases had their effect and she became cheerful again in the evening we took the limited for home we lived for a month with my mother and then moved into our own house it was one which i had rented from howard ogilvy and it stood on the corner of baker and clinton streets near that fashionable neighbourhood called the heights ogilvy who was some ten years older than i and who belonged to one of our old families had embarked on a career then becoming common but which at first was regarded as somewhat meteoric gradually abandoning the practice of law and perceiving the possibilities of the city of his birth he had gambled in real estate and other enterprises such as our local water company until he had quadrupled his inheritance he had built a mansion on grant avenue the wide thoroughfare bisecting the heights the house he had vacated was not large but essentially distinctive with the oddity characteristic of the revolt against the banal architecture of the eighties the curves of the tiled roof enfolded the upper windows the walls were thick the note one of mystery i remember maud's naive delight when we inspected it you'd never guess what the inside was like would you hugh she cried from the panelled box of an entrance hall one went up a few steps to a drawing-room which had a bowed recess like an oriel and window seats the dining-room was an odd shape and was wainscoted in oak it had a tiled fireplace and according to maud the sweetest china closet built into the wall there was a den for me and an octagonal reception room on the corner upstairs the bedrooms were quite as unusual the plumbing of the new pattern heavy and imposing maud expressed the air of seclusion when she exclaimed that she could almost imagine herself in one of the medieval towns we had seen abroad it's a dream hugh she sighed but do you think we can afford it this house i announced smiling is only a stepping-stone to the palace i intend to build you some day i don't want a palace she cried i'd rather live here like this always a certain vehemence in her manner troubled me i was charmed by this disposition for domesticity and yet i shrank from the contemplation of its permanency i felt vaguely at the time the possibility of a future conflict of temperaments maud was docile now but would she remain docile and was it in her nature to take ultimately the position that was desirable for my wife well she must be moulded before it were too late 
her ultra domestic tendencies must be halted as yet blissfully unaware of the inability of the masculine mind to fathom the subtleties of feminine relationships i was particularly desirous that maud and nancy durrett should be intimates the very day after our arrival and while we were still at my mother's nancy called on maud and took her out for a drive maud told me of it when i came home from the office dear old nancy i said i know you liked her of course you i should like her for your sake anyway she's she's one of your oldest and best friends but i want you to like her for her own sake i think i shall said maud she was so scrupulously truthful i was a little afraid of her at first afraid of nancy i exclaimed well you know she's much older than i i think she is sweet but she knows so much about the world so much that she doesn't say i can't describe it i smiled it's only her manner you'll get used to it when you know what she really is oh i hope so answered maud i'm very anxious to like her i do like her but it takes me such a lot of time to get to know people nancy asked us to dinner i want to help maud all i can if she'll let me nancy said why shouldn't she let you i asked she may not like me nancy replied nonsense i exclaimed nancy smiled it won't be my fault at any rate if she doesn't she said i wanted her to meet at first just the right people your old friends and a few others it is hard for a woman especially a young woman coming among strangers she glanced down the table to where maud sat talking to ham she has such an air about her a great deal of self-possession i too had noticed this with pride and relief for i knew maud had been nervous you're luckier than you deserve to be nancy reminded me but i hope you realize that she has a mind of her own that she will form her own opinions of people independently of you i must have betrayed the fact that i was a little startled for the remark came as a confirmation of what i had dimly felt of course she has i agreed somewhat lamely every woman has who is worth her salt nancy's smile bespoke a knowledge that seemed to transcend my own you do like her i demanded i like her very much indeed said nancy a little gravely she's simple she's real she has that which so few of us possess nowadays character but i've got to be prepared for the possibility that she may not get along with me why not i demanded there you are again with your old unwillingness to analyze a situation and face it for heaven's sake now that you have married her study her don't take her for granted can't you see that she doesn't care for the things that amuse me that make my life of course if you insist on making yourself out a hardened sophisticated woman i protested but she shook her head her roots are deeper she is in touch though she may not realize it with the fundamentals she is one of those women who are race-makers though somewhat perturbed i was struck by the phrase and i lost sight of nancy's generosity she looked me full in the face i wonder whether you can rise to her she said if i were you i should try you will be happier far happier than if you attempt to use her for your own ends as a contributor to your comfort and an auxiliary to your career i was afraid i confess it that you had married an aspiring simpering and empty-headed provincial like that mrs george hutchins whom i met once and who would sell her soul to be at my table well you escaped that and you may thank god for it you've got a chance think it over a chance i repeated though i gathered something of her meaning think it over 
said nancy again and she smiled but do you want me to bury myself in domesticity i demanded without grasping the significance of my words you'll find her reasonable i think you've got a chance now hugh don't spoil it she turned to leonard dickinson who sat on her other side when we got home i tried to conceal my anxiety as to maude's impressions of the evening i lit a cigarette and remarked that the dinner had been a success do you know what i've been wondering all evening maud asked why you didn't marry nancy instead of me well i replied it just didn't come off and nancy was telling me at dinner how fortunate i was to have married you maud passed this i can't see why she accepted hambleton durrett it seems horrible that such a woman as she is could have married just for money nancy has an odd streak in her i said but then we all have odd streaks she's the best friend in the world when she is your friend i'm sure of it maud agreed with a little note of penitence you enjoyed it i ventured cautiously oh yes she agreed and everyone was so nice to me for your sake of course don't be ridiculous i said i shan't tell you what nancy and the others said about you maud had the gift of silence what a beautiful house she sighed presently i know you'll think me silly but so much luxury as that frightens me a little in england in those places we saw it seemed natural enough but in america and they are all your friends seem to take it as a matter of course there's no reason why we shouldn't have beautiful things and well-served dinners too if we have the money to pay for them i suppose not she agreed absently end of section sixteen